hopefully yes. <laughs> so I'd like to note um, that as Elois uh, has reminded you, we are recording today's event uh, and it will be posted to the EBSS listserv as well as the ACRL website. So please be aware of that if you plan to make any comments. Um, please also keep your microphone muted and video turned off unless you are speaking. So that's primarily for speakers. So um, other attendees have chat abilities, but not uh, speaking. This is a webinar format. Hello, and welcome to the 2021 EBSS Virtual Research Forum, which offers librarians an opportunity to present current research, especially that which is relevant to librarians for education and behavioral sciences. My name is Annie Armstrong, and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. Uh, I am the current chair of the EBSS Research Committee, which organizes this event every year. Uh, Tamara Rhodes is the current vice chair and incoming chair, and she's also here to help introduce the event. So in case you're new to EBSS, um, it stands for the Education and Behavioral Sciences section of ACRL. Uh, formed in 1968, EBSS has over 900 members, and we always welcome new members who are interested in education and behavioral sciences librarianship. As the research committee within EBSS, we investigate and propose ways for education and behavioral science librarians to share ideas about new directions in education and behavioral science librarianship, research in progress or recently completed, and other current topics of interest. And we plan to hold these research related forums each year. Uh, so with this slide, I'd like to acknowledge this year's research committee, uh, which, as I've said, organizes this event every year. And next, I will turn the mic over to the committee's vice chair, Tamara. Great, so I'll start off with some, um, oh, go ahead. Just to confirm, we have begun recording. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank okay. you. <laughs> So I'll start with some logistics. Um, the research forum is scheduled for an hour. Each presenter will have 10 to 15 minutes to present. We'll do both presentations first, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions and discussion at the end. You are welcome to put any questions you have along the way in the chat box, but we'll wait until the end of the presentations to respond and discuss. Um, of course, at the end of this, we'll have a link to a feedback survey on the final slide, and we'll put that link in the chat as well. And we appreciate any feedback that you all share with us. Today's presentations were selected via a competitive open review process. The committee looks for original research that measures and investigates issues of high interest uh, to education and behavioral sciences librarians. We also evaluate each proposal's research design and analysis and new to the rubric this year, we also evaluate how education and behavioral sciences librarians consider and articulate how the research they do impacts diverse communities. Considering we have a pandemic year, we had a number of great proposals and we're really excited about the presentations we have for you today. So first we have uh, beliefs versus behaviors, data sharing, library support, and user access during a pandemic with Elizabeth DeZuch um, and Angelique Ben Blackburn from Texas A&M International University. And then our second presentation is what makes a source credible, helping pre-service social science studies or social studies teachers evaluate online resources. And that's with Allison Fay, Heather Hagen, and Elise Gockbull from Coastal Carolina University. So with that, let's get started with the presentations. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Elizabeth DeZuch. I'm the Information Literacy Librarian at Sue and Radcliffe Killam Library. My pronouns are she, her. And I'm joined today by my colleague, Dr. Angelique M. Blackburn, the Assistant Professor of Psychology, whose pronouns are she, her. We are joining you today from Texas A&M International, which is located in Laredo, Texas, on the US-Mexico border. We are a Hispanic serving institution 
with an enrollment of approximately 8,500 students. After the pandemic started to have an impact on us in the late spring, early summer of 2020, we were looking at the nationwide response to it and wondering what the local response was in regards to their information access needs and whether they thought that the Soon Radcliffe Killam Library should be one to help meet those needs. Next slide. Again, thank you. So during our research, we found many barriers to information access. And most of those are actually hidden or unseen by the public. So some say that the Freedom of Information Act is a remedy for government transparency and that data access should be an obvious human right. However, many amendments and exemptions have been added to the FOIA that started in 1967 that actually limit and hinder that access. Another barrier that is hidden to the average user is the academic publishing model, which we are all very familiar with, but there's delays to access due to the peer review process and journal embargoes. Even if most research is funded by taxpayers, it's never made public for various reasons, one of which is journal snobbery, meaning only the most trendy or valuable research may get published or even trickle down to the most popular news sources and periodicals, which is where most people get their information. In contrast, we have more and easier access to government information online. However, some studies have found that underutilization of e-government has actually led some people to focus on the digital divide rather than the social and behavioral reasons that people may not be accessing or using e-government. For example, a lack of information literacy and digital literacy skills, normative behaviors in social groups that may exclude or even repulse e-government uh, sources, or a general lack of trust and represent representation in government. Also, the example of the government shutdown in the fall of 2019 that shuttered agencies and took down websites did nothing to help this mistrust in government. So some research has found that exposure to news, social media, or health websites does not predict the ability of people to care about and deal with perceived harm. However, the research does demonstrate a willingness to listen to and enact some preventative measures. For example, some surveyed admitted to increased hand washing. So many would argue that preprints are a solution for quick data dissemination and access, especially in times of crisis like the pandemic. Preprints, by the way, are not peer reviewed. They often vary in quality and may actually never appear in a peer reviewed journal. And this can be very damaging and even deadly. Case in point, hydroxychloroquine, which, quote, may represent the most rapid medical reversal in recent history, a full pendulum swing from early enthusiasm to wide skepticism, end quote. While the digital divide is a prevalent barrier, most studies actually focus on that divide and dismiss other barriers to information access and utilization. Also, many studies focus on and use uh, middle to upper class white people as research and survey participants. So more research is needed on information needs and access behaviors of black, brown, and indigenous people. Next slide. So we created a 13 item survey that measures library, researcher, and publisher's obligations to provide resources, services, and information, um, specifically re related to a crisis such as the pandemic. We administered this survey to the Texas A&M International University, which is on the US-Mexico border, about six months after the local onset of the pandemic. And we ended up with about, we, we were shooting for about 20 to 25 participants in each group um, of students and faculty at the university, as well as surrounding community members who were unaffiliated with the university. And our local population is about 96% Hispanic, um, but our faculty um, are from a different demographic. So we had about 40% Hispanic and 60% non-Hispanic respondents, which is exactly what we would expect for this population. 
Um, once we had all of the data, we entered it into, uh, we did a principal components analysis because we wanted to make sure that the three components that we were measuring on the survey, library um, obligations to provide services, researchers obligations to share their data and publishers obligations to share information um, would be um, measured adequately by the questions that we had created and that they would be grouping together the way that we expected if we were measuring three separate constructs. So um, we ran the analysis and we did get three constructs, but the third one, um, which was the publisher's obligations, um, had some low factor loadings um, and some complex loadings. So um, we ended up removing that question from this or, or that, that segment from the survey, as well as some other items that had lower loadings, which is what we typically do when we're designing surveys. And that would give us the strongest possible survey. Um, and then we tested that version. And we ended up with two components exactly as predicted with incredibly high factor loading. So if you look in the table in front of you, um, anything greater than 0.3 or 0.4 would be considered to be a strong factor loading. And you can see that all of our loadings are very high, which means that all of our um, questions are really tapping into similar component uh, into the same components and these two different um, all the questions about research are tapping into the component about research. Researchers information uh, need to provide information and all the questions about library are tapping into libraries need to provide resources and services. Uh, so we've created this, this survey, we've tested the survey now and we've made it available so that anybody can use it if they would like to. Um, and we'll drop a link with our contact info if you would like to contact us for a version of it. Uh, next slide, please. So then we used this survey uh, to look at um, how what, what the public opinion, at least in our community, is regarding these two different components, the need to provide library resources and the need to share information. And we had proposed that younger adults might want more open access or more information sharing and more resources to be provided. Uh, so you can see in the chart on the left, um, we've on the x-axis are the ages from 18 to about 80 years of age. So we really do have participants of all different age groups. Um, and then on the y-axis, we're looking at the opinion regarding the right to information and resources on a scale of one to five, where five means that they strongly agree that there should be a right to, or an obligation to provide these resources and information. And what you're looking at in the orange line and all of the orange dots are representing library resources. So that's one of the, the components on the survey. And you can see anything greater than three would be considered somebody who agrees uh, that there should be a right to access. Um, and so you can see that there is a very strong agreement here. Um, most people believe that there should be, that the library should be providing resources and services. Um, and then when you look at the blue line, the blue line is about researchers needs to provide data. And you can see it's even higher. <laughs> so there is incredibly strong agreement for the need to provide information. Um, importantly, there was absolutely no correlation with age. So it doesn't matter how old individuals were across the board, there was just strong agreement that both of these obligations were necessary. Uh, so then we thought, well, maybe age doesn't matter but maybe the way in which people interact with information does matter. So students might be more inclined to want libraries to provide services and also for there to be more um, sharing of information on the researcher's part. Um, but when we looked at the three different groups, we got a very clear and consistent result, um, which is that in all three groups, uh, those unaffiliated with the university, students and faculty, um, there was still high agreement across the three groups, but in all three groups, there was um, in blue, you can see the library resources where there was a strong agreement that they should be providing library resources, but there was even stronger agreement again that researchers should be providing information regarding their research and their data. So this is just showing again, very strong agreement and a very consistent response that it doesn't matter how old you are, or um, what your role is within the university or even in the surrounding community, that there's just strong agreement that there should be um, resources and information sharing. Next slide, please. So this study could be replicated after the pandemic 
to see if people's information needs have been changed, we can also take this study out into the community and less on campus and see if the library still is a need to fill that gap. And as we've seen and experienced, libraries can and continue to actually fill that gap, whether it was by flexing our policies, hours, access, services, programming, staffing, et cetera. But did these changes actually reflect our users' needs and behaviors? So our research implies that our community, regardless of age or academic affiliation, demand access to open data slightly more than they believe that they need access to library resources. So this is crucial and invaluable information in future funding allocations. For example, more funding for staffing, programming, and outreach and marketing that could focus on media, digital, and data literacies. So hindsight is 2020, right? We can all now see the need for pre-crisis planning, especially planning to assist our high-risk communities that need more than just help crossing the digital divide. So health crisis communicators, educators, and libraries should not only talk to people uh, to understand what kind of information that they need to make decisions, but also who they want to deliver that message, right? And how that information would best be delivered. So this would mean involving them in the message creation process and not just in any testing or trials. So finally, make publicly funded research freely available, right? Libraries can leverage our resources, our power by advocating for educating and for educating communities about and facilitating open access research and data. Thank you all for listening to our talk and we welcome your questions at the end of the second presentation. If you'd like to reach out to us later, we will provide our resources and contact information in the chat in a Google Doc. Thank you. Okay, um, I will go ahead and start our presentation. Um, we are from Coastal Carolina University, which is um, a little bit out from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. We have about 10,000 students at our school. Um, and the research that we wanna share with you today actually didn't start in the library. It started as a collaboration. Um, the three of us were in the same writing circle. And as we talked to each other about our research and our interests, we realized that um, all three of us were very interested in doing research on fake news and misinformation and how we can help students navigate these challenges. Um, so we decided to work together on a study. Um, so I guess, next slide. <laughs> Um, so the purpose of the study um, was to find out more about how um, pre-service social studies teachers evaluated um, sources. Um, these students will soon be teachers who are teaching their own students to evaluate sources, and they'll also be choosing materials for their own classroom. So the way that they evaluate sources is really important. So we had two main research questions that we looked at. Um, was there a significant difference in how pre-service teachers um, evaluated sources before and after the source credibility instruction that we did for them, which was basically our um, library instruction session that we had? Um, and our other question was to find out more about how pre-service teachers were evaluating source credibility. Um, specifically, how do they understand and evaluate sources like Wikipedia and YouTube? And how do they approach looking for and evaluating their own sources online? So I'm gonna turn this over to Heather to talk a little bit more about our methods and results. Hi, so um, as she mentioned, these were pre-service teachers and we did um, an activity that we had based off of the Stanford History Education Group's um, civic online reasoning materials. 
and we used a rubric that um, that they had developed for um, the students to find and evaluate their own resources on a given topic, but then also to evaluate some resources that we gave them on a given topic. And we did that before and after the library instruction. Um, and so that brings us to our first question, which is there a significant difference in their levels of mastery and source evaluation before and after the instruction? Um, and this was, we had graded their assignments with a rubric and um, all of, they were each graded by two of us and to ensure inter-rater reliability. There was a relatively small sample size. And so um, we were unable to do a traditional t-test. So we did a Wilcoxon signed rank test um, with SPS software. And then our second research question um, was how do they evaluate source credibility? And so this was our qualitative data um, where we went back through those activities that they did and we, um, we looked for themes about which strategies they were using and how they were using those strategies. Um, and we organized those using um, to do software. Next slide, please. And so um, for the Wilcoxon um, signed rank test, the qualitative or the quantitative data, excuse me, um, they did the three activities, researching a claim that activity was where they looked for their own information on a given topic um, and then claims on YouTube and claim and evaluating Wikipedia and the, both of those we had given them particular information um, or particular YouTube video or particular Wikipedia entry to look at. Um, as you can see that the only one with a significant difference was researching a claim um, and we'll talk a little bit more about why we think that is and the implications for that later. But the qualitative data gave us quite a bit of information to look for. And I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about just the ways that they commonly looked at information. So quite often they looked at the website domain. They would look at um, if it was .org, .edu, .com. Um, and we covered this in the library instruction, but they continued to look at, um, they would really look for .edu or .org um, websites. They looked for citations. Now, one thing that we realized though, is that they did not look at what those citations were. They were simply looking for the presence of citations. So. If they had made citations at the end or in text, then the students considered the source as reliable. They didn't track down those citations. They didn't look if those citations were reliable or not. Um, they looked at fact, and then they looked at fact versus opinion versus bias. It was kind of a nuanced relationship. So they looked for facts. They might say like, this is a good source because it does it sticks to the facts or it uses tons of facts. So they, they liked a lot of facts, um, but they also um, related facts to not having bias or facts being different than opinion. So I'll just read you one of the quotes that, um, that they said, um, let me see. History.com is renowned all across the United States and always gives unbiased facts. Or um, the New York Times is the most trustworthy because the article is based on facts and not opinions. Okay, so there was the idea that facts are more trustworthy than opinions and that also facts indicated the absence of bias or that facts were always unbiased. Um, they looked for background information meaning that the students wanted enough information that the reader could understand what was in the article. Um, they looked at the reputation of the source. So this particularly came into play with Wikipedia. Almost immediately they would say, it's from Wikipedia, it's not reliable, um, or it's not trustworthy. Um, they looked at author expertise. Now, they didn't usually look to see who the author, like they didn't really read beyond the author byline or the author biography, um, but they did um, 
some authors seemed credible based on what they wrote in the article. So they might say the author seems to have background history on the topic or the author gave facts in her article and she has a background in reporting. Um, so it was those sorts of things. They didn't do a lot of deep digging into their background, but they did take their background into, into account. Um, they looked at source professionalism, specifically the article organization. So if an article was organized well, they considered it professional and reliable. If an arg article was organized in a way that was not very reader friendly, then they immediately said it was unreliable. Um, they also um, discounted the reliability of any articles that were um, included advertising or asked for you to create an account. Okay, but we also know that a lot of very reliable sources ask for you to create an account. Um, but when they did that, they immediately uh, thought that they were unreliable. And then Wikipedia and YouTube had some, um, just some unique things that the students pointed out for, um, for YouTube. If it seemed to have facts in the video, they would count it as reliable, regardless of if it had citations or not. Um, they just thought it sounded reliable, and so they they assumed that it was. Um, and for Wikipedia, <coughs> excuse me, oftentimes Wikipedia just couldn't um, get over just their prejudice against the source. So almost um, automatically, um, Wikipedia would be the least reliable, they would say. So they might say something like, Wikipedia would be the least reliable because while there are references, anyone can write and edit a Wikipedia article or anything on Wikipedia can be edited and manipulated. Next slide, please. Oh, okay, so I was gonna talk a little bit about the implications. Um, I think um, probably as librarians, many of us already have observed this, but I think one of our biggest takeaways was just that students did not want to use Wikipedia for any reason, and they would just automatically discount it. Um, but we know that there are um, ways of using Wikipedia that actually can be very beneficial for students. Um, and they didn't always seem to be aware that there were strategies for using it well. Um, so that was one thing that seemed important to note. Um, students really did not evaluate YouTube the same way that they evaluated the other sources. Um, I mean, it makes sense that YouTube videos don't usually have a works cited page at the end, but um, they did not look for any sort of references or research backing them up in the same way that they did um, uh, written sources. Um, so that seemed important to know. Um, and for all of the sources that they looked at, um, we observed that the students were not usually going outside of the source to help them evaluate it, which is um, the lateral reading strategy. Um, and they really needed encouragement to do that. They would um, trust what that source said about itself and they wouldn't go any further to fact check things in that source. Um, and I think the thing about it that gave us the most hope is that um, students did show improvement towards developing mastery of this um, and they would benefit from further practice. So. Um, even though they didn't get quite where we wanted them to go at the end of the library instruction session, um, I think it definitely did benefit them and um, they could continue working towards um, mastering these skills. Um, and we do have a link to our lesson plan that I'll put in the chat and some other information as well. Okay, thank you so much uh, to both groups. That was wonderful. Um, at this point, we have time for questions and we will be using the chat uh, for the Q&A. Um, so please use the all panelists and attendees option uh, as you're sending questions. Um, and we'll just get started. 
So we already have one, uh, a couple questions in the chat. So Jalissa asks for Elizabeth and Angelique. Do you have any interest in creating a collaborative research team of librarians at other colleges and universities where they replicate your survey with their own students, faculty, and community to create a larger data set? Absolutely. Yes, um, if you want to contact us or private message us with your contact information and we can follow up. Great. Um, and then another question, this one's for um, Heather and Allison. After working with these students, do you have any ideas about how to help students actively evaluate video sources? So I think um, looking for who produced the video and researching into that organization, um, as well as um, looking for source information. So even though they don't necessarily have citations, they often will say, well, according to this research study or according to Pew Research or whatever. Um, so looking for those sorts of signals as well. Allison, did you have anything else to add? Yeah, I was just gonna add that that wasn't something we specifically focused on in our library session. So I think that if we do this, when we do this again, um, that would be something that we could maybe spend some more time talking about. Because um, we just talked about sources in general, including videos, but not anything specific to videos. And then we have another question. Um, this one's for uh, Elizabeth and Angelique. How did you recruit respondents for your survey? So this was actually part of a larger study that we've been conducting. We're running a longitudinal study right now on the pandemic. Um, and so that study began in March of 2020. Um, and we had a pretty widespread effort to recruit participants for that. Um, one of the things we didn't want to do in so much of our research, um, it's, it's easy to recruit students compared to um, community members who aren't affiliated with the university and faculty as well, like um, because students, you can offer extra credit. Um, and so um, we didn't want to do that. We wanted to make sure that we were going to get a more representative sample that was gonna be more generalizable, but also to collect the data so we knew how the data would look for students compared to these other groups that we don't normally get a chance to tap into. Uh, so for this study in particular, um, once they joined the original study, then they were given a, a follow-up link to take another survey within the study. Um, so uh, it, was, it was kind of um, a follow-up to it, uh, but they could also link into it from, um, like directly into it as the initial survey that they took at, as part of that study as well. So it was a pretty widespread recruitment. <laughs> Great, and then someone else had another question for you all. Um, uh, how did you define or operationalize sharing and access for this study? What did this mean for, for you all? Um, I, I don't know if Elizabeth, if you wanna take that or if I should, but um, so we were, um, when we designed the survey questions, they were originally designed. Um, as a matter of fact, are you able to go back um, sure. to our slide, the one that has the questions up. Mm -hmm. It's in pink. Yes. Thanks. Um, so uh, we originally designed them with um, library, questions about libraries, obligations to provide services and resources, and then researchers' obligations to provide information about their research and their data. And then the third one, which has been removed now, was about publishers' obligations to provide information that had um, recently come out. Um, and so these questions were um, targeted around the onset of a crisis or the pandemic more specifically. So if you look at the questions um, on about the library, um, the last three on the bottom where it says lib, um, uh, they were mostly asking about libraries remaining uh, remaining open or being closed during the pandemic or continuing to provide um, resources and services. Um, and a lot of the motivation for that came from the fact that there were all the shutdowns happening around the time that this survey was being put out. Um, 
and then the researcher questions, uh, researcher obligations, um, those are more questions about um, the researchers, uh, transparency of researchers. So the researchers are sharing information about the research that they're doing and their data sets more specifically. Um, and that's also um, a, a little bit motivated by the fact that um, in the in the research side more generally, like um, there are different consortiums coming, uh, especially related to the pandemic where researchers are starting to provide information. There are some really large scale studies that were taking place um, during the same time period where um, like the COVID distress team put together something like 179 different countries and it's all open access data. So um, there's definitely this push to have all this research information um, publicly available, but like Elizabeth had mentioned, um, there's also that danger of putting it out too soon before it's gone through the peer review process. Uh, so this is kind of this idea, what, do, what does the public think about that? Um, should the information become open or not? Um, yeah, I don't know if Elizabeth- but I think also to... maybe they were, the question was asking about access. How do we define access, specifically user access? And I think that was a limitation in this first survey that we designed here. And Part of the longitudinal study that Dr. Blackburn was mentioning, we did a follow-up survey. So there's another component to this that's separate and it has slightly different questions that delve a little bit more deeply into the, how exactly do they access? Where do they access? Do they use public Wi-Fi? Do they use library Wi-Fi? Those type of access questions um, because this survey was implemented early on in the pandemic and the next one we had more time, but we really wanted to do it in that time period last year and so we quickly kind of, and I think people are seeing this, you know, um, with what's coming up out now. Great, thank you. Uh, so for Heather and Allison, we have a couple of questions. So the first one is, did you ask students whether they had had previous information literacy training in high school? We did not ask them formally we had some informal discussion um, and they made a lot of reference to specifically with web domains and Wikipedia. Oh, my teachers never let us use Wikipedia or, oh, my teachers said we have to use .gov, .org, or .edu sources. Um, but we didn't ask anything formally about if they've had literacy um, training before. And the second question, what were the demographics of your classes and do you think these have an effect on your outcomes? So they were um, elementary pre-service teachers. Um, and so the demographics was very similar to that national population, which um, is predominantly white middle-class female. Um, I do know in some ways, I think that there were probably impacts. In other ways, I think that in most ways, I should say, it really mimicked um, some of the broader research we're finding about college students overall. Allison, did you have anything else in particular? Um, not in particular, no, I agree. I think that we did um, think a little bit about that. Um, as far as like what we might do next is maybe we do want to like talk more with the students about bias um, during the library session as well. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, and then back to Elizabeth and Angelique, uh, do you have data or thoughts about using non-survey data to look at what people actually do versus what they report or think they do? Um, answer or take this any way you want. And thank you very much for asking, <laughs> answering. Absolutely. There's a lot of great uh, sources that we found that talk about how people use information, how they find their information. And even though in our survey, people indicated they believe the library should be open and should be providing all these services and resources for them, a lot of data indicates that young people utilize social media or their social groups for discovering and finding information, right? So 
well, you know, are they saying something in the survey and then doing something different? Of course, absolutely. And I will also drop into the chat again, uh, some of our resources and our contact information. So if anyone wants to follow up with us again, please do so. Thank you, good question. Annie, did you wanna answer or uh, ask your question? Yes, I have a cat meowing, so but I will ask my question out loud since I have the capability. So I just wondered if you could address um, how you selected the Stanford History Education Group um, model that you based your rubric on uh, and maybe other frameworks you considered, you know, and the strengths of, of that particular model for what you were doing in your research. So I think that I think we were very um, inspired by the study that that group did, um, which um, looked at the way that high school and college students um, analyzed research and it kind of just made sense to use rubrics that were already existing that were already proven to work really well, um, and especially because it was um, a focus on social studies right. Um, so it's coming from that group that is about teaching social studies and history. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say that the rubrics um, were designed in such a way that they were really easily adaptable to this context. Mm -hmm. And so um, we didn't use hardly, so Stanford Hif History Education Group has quite a bit of civic online reasoning materials. We didn't use those. We just used um, the rubrics that they had used with their um, in their research with middle, high school, and um, college students. And then we designed our own instrument, which basically was very similar to theirs, but we picked our own resources, our own articles, our own websites, um, and, and then used their instrument to go along with it. Um, which seemed to work really well. The difference was is that we were focusing on just the subset of pre-service teachers. And I'll ask a question. Um, as a follow-up to that, you just mentioned you, your um, specific population, pre-service teachers. Um, have you delved into at all like how this might relate or align with other kinds of teachers and um, like something a little more broadly? Like, did you see that in your literature review or have you um, thought about maybe expanding on that in the future or um, is it just focused on um, this population and how you're going to sort of like update um, the instruction with the students or with them? So right now it was purely a matter of convenience because I teach pre-service teachers. There was, I believe we found one study on practicing teachers. It was a little bit more about how their political beliefs impact their um, source analysis and evaluation. Um, in a perfect world, we would do this with lots of pre-service teachers and follow them longitudinally um, and see you know, what happens. Reality is though, I'm not sure I've seen a whole lot of professional development for teachers in this area. And so, you know, I it would be interesting to see what happens in the classroom. My guess is that most of their skills they gather during their teacher education process. Okay, are there any other questions for folks? Feel free to put it in the chat or raise your hand. Or also if either of the presentations, if you have something else you wanted to share that you didn't think would fit in the 10 to 15 minute mark, uh, if you'd like to expand on anything that we'd love to hear it. So Diana just put in a question and I think we addressed targeting respondents more so in our second follow-up survey. With the initial survey, we definitely just focused on the TAMU community and trying to just keep it local, to try to target as much as possible hit the Hispanic community, since we are 94% uh, Hispanic in Laredo. 
And we definitely did recruit um, diverse populations and communities when we did our follow-up survey as well. I think we got a few internationals um, and some out of state, but mostly I think Southeastern respondents for our second survey. And then there's another question to all the presenters. Uh, what's something about your project that you change or approach differently if you were to do it all over again? We did do it over again. <laughs> yeah, we did. But also I would love like to do more focus groups and actually get some um, follow up from the, the surveys. Cause I feel like there's a disconnect, like someone's question brought up, like they answer a survey one way cause maybe they know they're supposed to, right? Like democratically all libraries, yes, you need to be open and provide these services. But you know, in real day-to-day -day use or in emergency situations, I just ask my family, ask my pot of people or whatever. So I think that um, we lost some of that uh, qualitative when we were just, but it, it, during the time, right? We couldn't go out and, and do all these things because we were all doing things distanced. We still are doing a lot of things distanced. So again, replicating the survey would almost be a completely different animal, I think too, but. I would love to give even more library instruction um, because I feel like the students could have used so much more. Uh, it's just the reality of teaching it as part of a larger class. Um, but actually I am planning on doing more of it with my next section upcoming in the fall. Um, but definitely specific, specifically some YouTube and Wikipedia instruction on how to use those resources well. This is like off topic side note, but anytime someone brings that up in my instruction, I debunk that real quick. I'm like, look, I've edited articles. Do you know how hard it is? <laughs> like people will jump on you. Like you cannot even start a little, um, what's it called? It's not a white page. It's like a, um, it's like a draft of a Wikipedia article, you know, before people are like, nope, red listed, mm -hmm. get out of here. Yeah. And for I teachers, it's, can be such a useful resource, a, such a good starting point for it's their free. research. Everyone they can get it. Immediately, like, put up that wall of, nope, I can't use it. It's Wikipedia. Yeah. And I think um, just to add another aspect to that, I mean, I know that we constantly are cutting resources and encyclopedias are always on the chopping block. So helping students just become better prepared to use freely available sources is more important than ever. And also to in the uh, citations, Wikipedia encourages all of their editors to utilize and reference as much open source material as possible. So not just those paywalled sources, mm -hmm. but eBooks and open access materials. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I will specifically identify those when I'm trying to draft an article or I like to do um, Wikipedia articles for women off, um, artists that are not represented. Maybe they don't have a page yet or something, but um, finding those open access resources so that they're available for the most, most people. We have a really great question that came up in the chat. Thank you, Julissa, for asking this. What strategies do you use to find time to focus on research? It seems like we all have multiple job duties and it's often difficult to make time for research when we also have emails and meetings and teaching, et cetera. And I'll also add to that, especially since you did your study at the very beginning of the pandemic, that shocked me the most. <laughs> I was like, wait, you're doing what? So this is a really great question. I'd like to know the answer to as well. I might jump in on this one a little bit. Um, I think that if you can find a collaborator that you work well with, that you get along with, 
um, and that you genuinely like, <laughs> it makes a huge difference because it becomes um, a social event as much as it becomes a uh, a job, right? So working with Elizabeth, um, like I, I'm actually working on a number of different research projects right now. And this is the one that's moving the fastest. And it's moving the fastest because we get along so well. And we think um, kind of like on the same wavelength when we're designing things. And we complement each other very well, because we come from slightly different fields. But they the way we're, we're working together is just merging perfectly. So um, I would say finding a a good collaborator is priceless when it comes to making strides in research. Yeah, share the work, like get people on board and lighten the load for yourself. And um, also not just find someone that you like working with and that you work well with together, but also uh, something that you're genuinely interested in, not just that something that aligns with your work and you gotta do it because it's half of your work or counts towards tenure or whatever, but something that you're genuinely interested in and that can help drive you too. I'd echo all of that. And as Allison pointed out, we started um, our collaboration as part of a writing circle. And um, I would say those have been invaluable to me to moving my research along and my writing along because it's always that time carved out every week. I have not done one in a year because of the pandemic. And um, it's my, um, well, for a lot of reasons, my productivity has suffered, right? But that is one of them because that, you know, it's that accountability and the structure that has been really helpful um, in that time. So if, if your, ours is offered through our university, but I know that there's online writing groups as well. And I think that um, those have been really, um, really good for me. Great. Um, and then the last thing in the chat, we just have a comment from Lynn about um, Wikipedia. And um, Lynn wonders if uh, it would be instructive for students to have them change Wikipedia. I suspect they would be surprised how quickly their change is corrected back to the original if there is no citation. Many Wikipedia sites are very vigilant editors who are experts in their field. Yes, I was told. Oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. I was going to say, I always tell the story of how I tried to fix our library's Wikipedia page and it's still not fixed. <laughs> they revert it back. I think I've seen some other people utilize Wikipedia more um, in classes and not just one shot sessions. So we've had a program at another institution where it was a drop in style. And the thing about Wikipedia is it's a steep learning curve to learn the back end of editing Wikipedia. It takes time. And also to, you know, make sure that your research skills, you can't just be a novice researcher. You kind of do have to have some experience under your belt. So something more um, semester long would be great because honestly, seeing that page get published and see it go live is like the most awesome thing. You're like, Yay. okay. Hello, Lois. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that, Elizabeth. Um, and then Francis mentions, for the question about finding time for research, I don't have tenure at my institution, so research was not part of my job description, but I've been able to make a case for how my research improves my instruction and reference and therefore helps our patrons. Making a case to yourself and your supervisor can help to set time boundaries on other duties. Just my experience. Great point. Thank you, Francis. Yeah, Francis, I'm a non tenure track uh, librarian as well. And it's service not just to the TAMIU community with your research or whatever community you're at, but service back to the field of librarianship too, if you want to spin it that way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I have um, 
just wanted to point out that I put a link to our evaluation survey for today's event in the chat, but let me put it at the bottom again. Uh, we run this event every year and we find your feedback Im immensely useful uh, just in how we structure the event. But there are some additional comments. We still have a few minutes left. Uh, so for presentation two, uh, it's so interesting to hear about pre-service teachers talk about facts. My fourth graders' research reports and informational writing assignments are all framed as go and find facts, don't use Wikipedia. As a result, he looks for lists of facts or bullets. His websites are often not credible. Yeah. Um, I, fact and opinion is a basic skill that we teach our elementary school students and it's part of where we start, but they don't get that nuanced and in looking for facts, exactly like what you said, um, they oftentimes look for bullets. They look for lists because it's, they have to sift through text to pick out the facts and it's a lot easier to to have a list of facts that you can pull from and so you know but then that sets them up for looking for facts right um and not necessarily the ones that are nuanced or buried but the ones that are easily accessible and unfortunately some of our pre-service teachers do that as well and um and as we shared right they look for facts and they look for facts thinking that facts are completely unbiased not accounting for the the idea that who who picked these facts to share and why are these the ones that are there and and all of that so um i think that that's really important and i think your comment points out the fact that we do need to Yes, fact versus opinion is a starting point, but we need to make sure that we get past that. Definitely, there are so many nuances. I think this could go on <laughs> for another hour uh, in the new environment that we're in. Um, I just want to acknowledge that we're almost out of time. Uh, and I wanted to thank all of our presenters for their thoughtful presentations, as well as your uh, contributions through the Q&A and really sharing more about your process um, and your research. So um, as I mentioned, we encourage you to fill out the link to the evaluation survey. And thank you all for attending this year's EBSS Research Forum. Um, if you have any further questions, you can contact any of the presenters directly, or you can contact either myself or Tamara, uh, the chair and uh, vice chair. Um, and I'll put my email address in here. Uh, Tamara, would you like to add yours? And we hope to see you at next year's forum. And also we encourage you to think about participating and uh, putting out or responding to our call for proposals. Um, I don't know if you wanna say anything more about that, Tamara since you'll be taking over? Um, I'd just like to say, yeah, if you have any ideas burgeoning, like feel free to reach out. Um, and uh, I hope to see your proposals in the slate next year. We're always excited to see what new research folks are getting up to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you, I, I think you would encourage this, but if you have questions about whether or not your um, project is appropriate for this forum, Tamara would be happy to discuss that with you. Agreed. So thank you all. Uh, we will stop recording at this point and we will post this uh, on the EBSS website uh, 